Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room Podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and Podcast Editor of the War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. As the cliche goes, we live in interesting times when it comes to civil-military relations in the United States, in the aftermath of the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. After enjoying widespread public support across partisan divides for decades, the U.S. military today has been drawn into those divisions, struggling to meet recruiting goals and to regain its privileged position in the minds of Americans, while facing the combined challenges of threats from abroad and resource constraints at home. Civilian control of the military is an American article of faith, but like many articles of faith, it can be repeated by those who may not understand its meaning, while those responsible for putting the faith into practice may operate at cross-purposes, consciously or unconsciously. In response to the very real challenge of understanding civil-military relations during these interesting times, the Army War College has established its Civil Military Relations Center with the mission, quote, to sponsor and promote the development of a healthy, sustainable relationship between the American military, society, and political leaders through education, research, and outreach. Here at A Better Peace, we welcome the chance to inform the broader national security audience about new initiatives at the Army War College, and thus we are pleased to have with us today as a guest the co-founder and inaugural co-director of the CMRC, Dr. Carrie A. Lee. Dr. Lee is an associate professor at the U.S. Army War College, where she serves as the chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy, which makes her my boss. So I'm, I'm really trying hard not to make any mistakes in this conversation, as well as the co-director of the Center for, for Civil Military Relations. Holder of degrees from MIT and Stanford, as well as a variety of fellowships, she studies how democratic political institutions affect interstate conflict, military operations, and foreign policy decision-making. And we are delighted to have her with us today on A Better Peace. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for having me. And you're doing great so far. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll have you write a note to the department chair about this afterwards. <laughs> So, um, so Dr. Lee, what, what inspired your decision to uh, not just to study civil military relations sort of as part of your own individual research agenda, but to establish this center at the War College? So, I mean, I think you did a really good job in the introduction of highlighting some of the contemporary challenges that we see in the civil military relationship today. Uh, just over the last 10 years, you know, civil military relations, especially at the elite level, have grown really fractious. And so we've seen a lot of tension in decision making between the president and the Pentagon, questions about the degree to which there is civilian control over the military or how much does the military run foreign policy in the United States. Um, the prominence of retired generals uh, in partisan politics the increasing politicization of the military and the use of the military as a partisan political prop. And then most recently, we have this big recruiting crisis where the army missed its recruiting goals by 15,000 soldiers last year and looks like it's not going to meet its targets this year. So this hasn't escaped notice. Um, practitioners and scholars have been commenting um, but it's also led to a new generation of thinking, scholarship, and concern amongst more, much more junior cadres. Um, and yet there was no kind of dedicated institution, despite this being a really exciting time, to facilitating new thought, right, across disciplines that also bridged the academic practitioner gap in a deliberate way. Um, and so... The center is really intended to provide an intellectual home and a center of gravity for this new generation of scholars as well as practitioners. Um, it makes sense in a lot of ways to do this here at the Army War College. The Army is the service that has traditionally been closest to the American people and kind of the average American. 
Here at the War College, we look at, we sit at the intersection of strategic thinking. And so helping the Army and the American public and scholars and researchers to think strategically about civil military challenges is a natural fit for us. Um, and then our location as well here in Carlisle, just outside of DC. So it's easy to, um, it, it's really easy to attract people and be close to the center of power without having to be right in the middle of the beltway. Um, in addition, I want to say that we have a lot of faculty expertise here who study in some way, shape or form civil military relations. And that's been a huge benefit to us as well, being able to leverage their expertise. You, all the things that you mentioned there, right? The, when when you when you see these as uh, as current problems, right? They've been building for a while, right? The partisanship and even the declining in in uh, uh, recruiting. And I I'm asking myself as I was preparing for this program is when we see th things happen that we would consider to be sort of problematic, to use an academic term, problematic in dealing with civil military relations, like general officers deciding to take part in positions or uh, or any 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 things like that do we attribute those kinds of developments to a misunderstanding about the nature of civil military relations or is there some are there some other forces at work that are sort of pushing the military to become more political oh good question uh so i i i have to say that we're in a moment now where I think we're at the cross section of the deterioration of norms across the force um, that have been in the making for several decades. You know, with the end of the Cold War, we stopped paying a lot of attention to professional military education. We stopped paying a lot of attention to civil military relations because the size of the army was declining, the prospect of long term war and kind of big strategic war with the Soviet Union had declined. And this led, I think, to less emphasis on thinking about the important professional norms of civil military relations within the force itself. And so emphasizing to officers coming in in the 1990s and even in the early 2000s that, no, getting involved in partisan politics is a bad idea, right? That if you do choose to get involved, even when you're retired, that this could compromise the institution itself, right? And so there's, there's, I think, less, less commitment to the nonpartisan ethic of the military that's a function of a deterioration of norms and education in places like the war colleges, uh, combined with two other things that are societal or kind of civilian political. Um, the first is that the military is held in extremely high esteem by the American public and it is the only government institution which is held in high esteem. And so the public is much more willing to defer to military expertise. They're much more willing to see the military as a check on other institutions that they don't like or that they think are partisan. And so the public is uh, in many ways facilitating a a rise in kind of the ability of the military to exert political power because it is the only institution that is considered trusted. Third is that civilian leaders are increasingly finding that it's, and it's related civilian leaders are increasingly finding this a tempting thing to capitalize on for their own political fortunes. A lot of those norms that civilian leaders have traditionally abided by are deteriorating because the prospect of politicizing the military actually comes with benefits now. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can, if, if basically that being able to have somebody in uniform support you is seen as a uh, a, po a net positive in the competition for political advantage. Right. And no one, uh, either a member of your own party or the other party is going to sanction you for it. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and, and this gets to this, you know, we talk about, well, there's a lot of talk in literature about the civil military gap and about various misunderstandings. And it, it, it the, these gaps, they go both ways, right? We can talk about the need for a uh, professional military, uh, a professional military to understand the political system, but also to know where they're supposed to be in it. But there's also the problem of a society in which fewer and fewer members of society serve in the military, that we have civilian leaders who uh, have less and less uh, particular relationship to the military. 
And how do we imagine helping civilian leaders, elected, appointed leaders, um, uh, how do we imagine helping them to understand the military better? It's one thing here at the War College, we get we get these officers and we get them here and we say, you need to understand civil military relations better. And that's great. But I've often gotten a question from my students, right? Well, who's teaching the future Congress people and members of the cabinet about the military so that they'll understand the military when they show up at these meetings? So the short answer is no one is doing that. <laughs> right. um, that is that is not a requirement for holding office, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, having any subject matter expertise on anything is not a requirement for holding office in True. this country. Yes. Um, and so there there is no one who sits civilian leaders down and especially newly elected members of Congress, right, and says, "Here's the military 101. Here's what you need to know if you're going to sit on the Armed Services Committee." Now, one hopes that they do, right? And they have staffers who are responsible for getting them up to speed on the relevant issues. But we have really interesting research that shows that veterans in Congress tend to be much more skeptical about the military. They tend to ask harder questions of military leaders when they go up for budgets and have requests and um, all kinds of other kind of authorization and oversight functions. Uh, so familiarity with the military is a good thing when Congress is exerting its oversight capacity and um, trying to figure out, you know, what do we really need and what maybe don't we need so much or the um, money would be best spent doing something else for the welfare of the American people. I, I will say, you know, a lot of that education actually comes from legislative liaisons that military the military sends to congressional offices. And hmm. so the military does embed parts of um, its kind of mid-grade officers into congressional offices so that they can help to answer questions about uh, military affairs. Right. Well, and uh, the the center had as it, as uh, as part of its sort of grand opening, right? The center did sponsor a conference uh, in recent weeks on the 50th anniversary of the all volunteer force, and. In what ways does the existence of a volunteer military both, let's say, how, how, does, how can that both promote but also uh, create problems for civil military relations? So this is a terrific question that has been robustly debated this year at no fewer than six conferences. Um, ours was the, the kind of capstone event of a season of conferencing about the all-volunteer force as it reaches its 50-year anniversary on July 1st of this year. And the, the arguments, first of all, you know, we have an all-volunteer but also an all-recruited force. And so we spend a lot of time in recruiting, getting people from the, well, maybe this is something I could be interested in to being, to signing on the dotted line and saying, yes, this is something I'm enthusiastic about, um, or if not enthusiastic, sufficiently induced. And, uh, and, and so, but there are pros and cons to that, right? If you are the movement away from the draft and the commission that first kind of investigated how we might do this was called the Gates Commission. And some of the things that they expressed concern about in the transition to the all-volunteer force was, number one, that we were going to have a hard time recruiting and, you know, who would choose to join the military. Um, the types of people that would choose to join the military would be the kind of dregs of society, which would lead to discipline problems and a less effective fighting force. So we're le looking at the Gates Commission was concerned that we might be looking at a smaller, less effective force that was unable to meet the challenges of the Cold War, even while we were doing detente in the 1970s. So this was a big concern of theirs. I tend to think that on the effectiveness piece and the professionalism piece, the all-volunteer force has been a dramatic success. Um, we are, the American military is kind of the envy of militaries across the globe when it comes to operational and tactical effectiveness, when it comes to levels of professionalism. We are the ones who do the advise and assist missions. We are the ones who bring people into our professional military education from across the world and have high demand for that kind of education. So I think on those aspects, the AVF has, has laid to rest many of the questions that the Gates Commission had. On the gap issue, though, we are seeing an increasing gap between who serves and who does not. 
So 83% of new recruits today, this is a pretty well-known statistic, have a family member who have served. Increasingly, we're looking at 40 or 50% of new recruits who have a parent who served. So this is becoming a, a real family business, which you know begs the question of what's the rest of America doing and what is their relationship to military service members? Do other Americans even see military service as an option? Do they see it as an obligation of their citizenship or some kind of service to country as an obligation of citizenship? We have really hard questions to kind of continue to, to ask mm -hmm. as, the, as we go forward. And do you see the center uh, uh, addressing those kinds of questions or encouraging work on those kinds of questions going forward? Absolutely. So I, I hope that the center will both encourage research and encourage good thinking about and systematic thinking about recruiting challenges and how we sustain an all volunteer force because both the logistics and I think, in my personal opinion, morality of going back to a draft is to use the academic term, problematic. And, um, but also I'm hoping that the center will create a forum to have hard conversations like this. And so that we can be that intellectual center of gravity that is encouraging people to come in and explore new ideas and feel free to, you know, question the premise of, of the question and mm -hmm. um, have these kind of big big conversations. Right. Well, and, and this, this leads me to ask you, a, uh, uh, I have, a, I have a couple of sort of big academic questions since I've got you here that I want to ask you, but one, one of the ones that I was struggling with in thinking about this and also in hearing what you were just saying is, you know, we have, we are approaching this terrible recruiting, these recruiting challenges now. Um, we, these could have been foreseen on the horizon, perhaps early in this period of, of, uh, intense military, uh, engagement abroad. And yet, uh, you know, as you say, the Gates commission m was wrong in assuming we wouldn't be able to have an effective force that could actually fight. Cause it turns out that this force was pretty effective and could fight for, for a good long time. How much is the current recruiting problem, uh, a sort of delayed reaction to 20 years of constant, uh, of, of constant uh, engagement abroad? Um, and how much of it is related to an end to military engagement abroad? Great question. Yeah. Um, I'm saying that a lot right now. Um, so I, I actually I'm, think that I'm, I'm hoping probably... my department chair finds out about this. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I tend to see the current recruiting crisis as the product of three things. Um, the first two are proximate in that um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had recruiters, you know, kicked out of schools and transitioned to online learning. And so we're looking at the effects of COVID-19 as people are having less access to and less interaction with people in uniform and with military recruiters. Qualifications for service are going down because of COVID-19. So health issues associated that young people are experiencing as a result of being indoors all the time, not playing team sports, people are less healthy and fit after the pandemic, and uh, learning has gone down. And so learning loss as a result of online learning means that ASFAB scores, which is the, um, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but it is the, the academic test that the military requires um, it's, it's new recruits to take in order to determine whether they are qualified to serve uh, intellectually. Those scores have been going down. And I, I attribute all of that to, um, or a large portion of that to COVID. Um, the second proximate cause is just simple labor economics. Uh, we're in a job market that is extremely tight. The United States military is not the only organization that is struggling to recruit people and uh, get people on board. So uh, if we continue to see these issues, you know, in three years after a recession and the labor market opens back up, um, then I will be kind of very seriously concerned and thinking like, oh, this is a crisis. But recruiting numbers have been going down for a long time. And so this is a structural thing that I think we need to be paying a lot of attention to. And the last 20 years of war absolutely has something to do with that. Um, and the way that I think it's impacting is that veterans today are less likely than any generation before to recommend military service. So if we have, it's a numbers game then. 
If 83% of new recruits coming in have a family member who served, but those family members are now less likely to recommend service because of demands on family, high op tempo, difficulties in getting benefits, the cuts to benefits, all of these types of things, then you're going to be facing a really serious challenge. And I guess the problem is is that we can see some of these problems coming or we can see them affecting us now. How does one turn those kinds of things around? When you say, you know, when, when somebody says it's a structural problem, like, well, then I guess we got to change the structures. But but are we, are, are, do we have to stop doing some things that actually looked like they worked? Or do we have to start doing new, brand new things in order to bring people back to the to military service? So I tend to think that the DOD should be focusing on kind of two big structural changes that are impacting the economy and impacting kind of social structures in the United States. So from an economics perspective, the nature of the economy is quite simply just changing. And we've moved from an industrial economy into an information age economy. We have transferred a lot of risk away from organizations and corporations and the government onto individuals in ways that are seriously impacting their decision making. Um, We are exhibiting... um, We see big shortages in necessary goods and services, right? Shortages in healthcare, shortages in uh, housing and housing markets in kind of economically productive areas. You see shortages of mental health care providers and child care providers and all kinds of things. All of these areas are places where the military should be extremely competitive, right? TRICARE is um, the United States' probably most successful experiment in universal health care. And uh, it offers childcare on bases. There is base housing and they offer um, reasonable, pretty reasonable base housing allowances if you want to live off post and so or off base, I should say. And and so these are places where the military should be competitive, but they have also been cutting services and cutting quality and um, and this has led to, you know, scandals in the paper about mold in barracks and I can't find childcare or cuts to childcare for D- DOD civilians, all of these kinds of things. So I, I really think DOD should be reinvesting in a lot of these benefits that are attractive to young people because they're because um, they're dealing with so much instability in their own lives. The second place is, you know, the changing nature of just families in America. Um, People are getting married later. They're having fewer kids. The way in which men are expected to participate in family and home life, uh, this nature of co-parenting, right? Um, And so no longer are we in a world where you have a sole breadwinner who goes to work for long hours, has a spouse at home who takes care of home and family and kids, and then... um, you know, but but is relatively impervious to the number of hours or how the length of time in which the breadwinner is gone. That is no longer the case. We don't exist in that world anymore, and it's, we're never going back. So, I think that the what the military can do, particularly to improve retention and improve veterans' attitudes about the military as an organization in supporting things like families. Um, really has to do with making space for their service members who feel who need to be at home, who need to be spending time with families, who need that kind of flexibility as uh, women are increasingly empowered and the nature of relationships are are changing to be much more kind of co-equal and dealing with kind of dual income households. Right. I, I was thinking that it's it's almost a cliche at the at the war college that a senior leader will come and will address the the assembled officers and say, go to the go to the soccer game, be part of your family. We want you to do that. Um, and you know that's what that's because the army puts people first. And then when somebody asks the the senior leader, well, sir, were you able to do any of that when to to get where you are? The answer is, well, no, of course not. Um, which does make things very difficult. But here we get to, we talk about the civil military gap, right? One of the real challenges for civilians when they think about the U.S. military, right? The one thing that most civilians in the United States know about the United States military is that it costs between 700 and $800 billion a year to run. And that's a lot of money. 
And so when we're when we start talking about things that the military is doing or that needs to do, when we talk about resource constraints, we talk about the need to spend money on other things, right? How exactly are we supposed to communicate that? Or how is the military? I shouldn't say we, even though we are part of the military, I suppose. But how are we supposed <laughs> to communicate to the broader American public? Um, you know that 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 somehow we can't get by on the seven hundred and thirty-five billion dollars that we got last year. So this is this is a struggle, right? Um, it's a big organization that does a lot of things. Um, the biggest the biggest part of the DoD budget is personnel costs. And so I always start out by saying, well, how many people do you want to cut from the military? And you know what units then abroad are you willing to? shut down? Should we leave Germany? Should we leave Japan? Should we not have a presence in the Philippines? What about, um, you know, Italy and and South Korea, et cetera, right? So a big part of DOD budgets are personnel and simply making sure that we have enough people to do the mission. Now, I will say as a side note, we're having a very interesting conversation in the United States right now about what America's role in the world should be. And that comes with implications for how many people do we need in our military. If we significantly scale back our global commitments, that then comes with a smaller military and a less need for people. Um, so depending on where you fall along that argument, whether you think America should be you know, uh, abroad and kind of forward leaning as opposed to kind of you know, more restraint oriented, um, that has implications. But I guess this gets back to a larger question. And as we sort of bring this conversation back to the work of the center and the work of understanding civil military relations, that you know, there are top line pieces of information that people may think they know about the military, just as there are top line pieces of information that the military think they know about American political life, right? There's always the army officers will say, their frustration is uh, we have elections all the time and every time we have elections, right, policy can change. And so there's no consistency and that the, the military, because we're professionals, right, we're able to plan in longer time periods. Um, and that requires, right, each side assumes that the other side both has it easier um, and and is somehow taking advantage of the other, right? So the civilians who feel like the military's got all this money, so they're taking advantage of us. The military will feel like, you know, we're just expected to follow the policy and the civilians are taking advantage of us because they get to change their minds all the time. Um, do we, it, can we imagine a better level of dialogue between the civilian and military sides in the United States that will help us to understand that we are actually all in this together um, and that while we are, that we can be different Right? There can be different responsibilities on a professional military than on their civilian leaders, and a, that there is a difference between serving in the military and not serving in the military, while understanding that these, these differences can be complementary rather than contradictory. What do you think about that? So I will, I'll tell you what I tell my students uh, when I get questions like this or when I hear comments like this, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is... That you took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, and the Constitution says that the only legitimate commander of the armed forces is the elected president of the United States. And so this very institution that you are sworn to defend, there's a, you know, the Constitution gives legitimacy to Congress for oversight and appropriations. Um, so the administrative control of the military really falls along Congress, and that is the only, those are the only people who legitimately can make those decisions. And then operational control to the commander in chief, to the United States president and those that he delegates, he or she um, delegates. So to complain about the, the role that the civilians play in making decisions or in trying to win elections, et cetera, is to complain about the legitimacy of the system itself. And, and that's unhealthy and unhelpful. Um, and what's further, I, 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 I go one step further in thinking that the point of elections and the point of pandering to the public is to try and get a sense of what it is the public wants, right? Because the power of the government ultimately comes from the people. And this is where I'm an idealistic, small D Democrat, right? Um, but Ultimately, you know, the reason why we have elections is so that the people can express their attitudes and hold elected leaders accountable for the policies that they are pursuing and then choose the leaders who best represent the policies that the American people want. 
And that's really what the institution is designed to do. So complaining about elections is not that helpful because ultimately, like politicians are just trying to do what the system has incentivized them to do, which is represent the will of the American people. Um, on the civilian side, you know, as the military has all this money, the military has has all these resources. Number one, I think they're totally right. Um, and it creates huge temptations to use the military for things that it probably shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's something that civilian leaders need to be very careful about, right? When you talk about COVID vaccine uh, rollout, and we're talking about using the military to, you know, go in and roll out the COVID vaccination protocols, which was something that was seriously considered at the time. Um, that's unhelpful and unhealthy because it takes away, takes the military away from its core competencies um, just because they have the people, the personnel, the resources to do it. Right. Well, and and that is, of course, so the ongoing discussion is if we're, you know, we have citizen, citizen service members are serving their fellow citizens um, and there needs to be a certain degree of permeability between the two so that citizens can choose to join the service and that service members understand the citizens they're protecting. Um, how, uh, wh what plans does the Center for Civil Military Relations have for the coming year uh, to begin to address all these manifold questions of civil military relations. So we have, I'm going to highlight two programs that we have kind of taken under our umbrella that do a deliberate, that deliberately try to reach out to the American public more broadly. The first um, we've already done podcasts on with the, um, the Eisenhower series college program here at a better peace. And so these students are selected. This is a long running program that the Army War College has. And our students go out and have conversations with future leaders, right? College students and community leaders and uh, ROTC cadets and whatnot about big national security issues. It really helps to bridge the, the civ mill divide between the war college and the civilian college. Um, we also have a program called the National Security Seminar, which uh, invites 160 uh, people from across the United States to come and spend a week at the War College participating in what we do here, uh, which I think is a, a terrific outreach program and really helps uh, people get an inside look into um, not just the War College's mission, but sort of the Army more broadly. As far as center-sponsored programming goes, um, this fall we will continue our fall workshop series. Um, where we invite from a research perspective and, and a, a education perspective, we invite kind of some of the, the biggest names and uh, best thinkers in civil military relations who are publishing kind of recent work and have new books coming out to come and speak with us about their research, um, helping us to move beyond some of the more trite readings that sort of seem to always show up in civil military relations syllabi, the Sam Huntingtons and the Morris Janowitzes and whatnot. Um, we have moved beyond this. And so it's really important that our faculty and our students get exposed to some of this new thinking. Um, so we do every Thursday afternoon, we have a new speaker starting in September. We'll go on for about 10 or 12 sessions over the course of the fall. It will be live streamed. There will be registration options. So we are opening it up this year to a broader audience um, and participation. And then next spring, we'll have uh, the second annual conference on civil military relations. Theme of that conference is to be announced. Um, but we will do very similar to last year. We'll have a big call for papers and uh, proposals from burgeoning academics and practitioners who have things that they want to say, um, mash it all together, and then have a, a two-day nerd fest on civil military relations next May. It'll be May 4th and 5th. May 4th and 5th, mark your calendars. And so if you want to know further updates about uh, activities at the center and also um, other podcasts, conversations, uh, articles that have been published by people connected to the center, the center can be found on the web at cmrc.armywarcollege.com. Edu. We encourage you to go check that out. And we want to thank the director of the CMRC, Dr. Carrie Lee, for joining us today on A Better Peace. Thanks for being here, Dr. Lee. 
Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. And thanks all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Please send us your suggestions for future programs. Please take a moment after you have digested all the information that you've learned today and subscribe to A Better Peace because why would you not want to subscribe to A Better Peace? And after you have subscribed to A Better Peace, please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice, because that's the best way for other people to find out about us. We're always interested in growing this community for conversations like this one. And even though this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you next time. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.